Congressman Jamie Raskin says the January 6th committee revelations will blow the roof off the House. Marjorie Taylor Greene insurrection hearings in Georgia are broadcast live. We break it down. The Kevin McCarthy tapes audio recordings from Republican leadership conference calls following the insurrection exposes Kevin McCarthy as a liar and exposes him saying he would ask Trump to resign after saying him saying that was fake news, a total liar. Alex Jones puts Infowars into bankruptcy on the eve of the Sandy Hook defamation jury trial on damages delaying the case will justice be served the department of justice files an appeal on behalf of the cdc challenging the florida district court order prohibiting the mask mandates in public transit and civil rights groups sue florida officials for their racist and partisan gerrymandering created by governor death santis the most consequential legal news of the week this is Legal AF. Ben Mycel is joined by Michael Popak. Popak, the Popokian, how are you doing today? I am doing great. I got, I'm all energized after watching hours of Marjorie Taylor Greene. And I know our, our followers and our audience are ready for us to dive in this week. And, uh, and uh, you got me fired up with that intro. Let's go. We're going to take a deep dive into what happened in the Marjorie Taylor Greene case. Many people are saying, Ben Popak, tell me, what was this hearing? Is this a jury trial? Is this a civil case? Is this an administrative case? Like, what was I watching? By the way, you were probably watching it on the Midas Touch live stream feed. Midas Touch will be doing more live streams like that of consequential hearings. We had about 30,000 concurrent viewers, about half a million people tuned in on the Midas feed alone thus far. And I think it was an important aspect to add to the Midas repertoire of the services and content we deliver. I think one thing we should ask the the audience tonight on live chat is whether they would like the, one or three of us, you, me, and Karen, to do some sort of live analysis during some of these seminal, uh, you know, uh, uh, trials of the century type matters, because uh, we're willing to do it if people are willing to um, to watch us do it. Well, I think that would be a great addition as well, Popak. So let's get into it. Let's take it in reverse order to start. Let's talk about the civil rights group sue these Florida officials for their racist and partisan gerrymandering maps. We talked about this before, that the Republican legislature in Florida proposed racist gerrymander maps. And for Governor DeSantis, he said, whoa, 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 not racist and partisan enough for me. True. I'm going to veto those maps unless you make those maps even more partisan and racist. You know, Florida is an interesting state, Popak. We've discussed it before because they have specific constitutional amendments that have anti-political gerrymandering provisions, not just the constitutional protections of the anti-racist gerrymandering embodied in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which the Supreme Court has eroded. We've covered in detail the erosion, the attack on the Voting Rights Act of 1965 on the Midas Touch podcast, a long line of attacks from the Federalist Society spanning many, many, many years, basically trying to declare the United States free of racism such that the judges should not be scrutinizing the legislature's decision making in making the maps. There used to be a process actually called preclearance that up until 2013 was taking place in the pre clearance was that you had either the DOJ or a three judge panel. It means what it said. They would pre clear the maps before a map would be approved. It would have to go get approval by the government to say, is that map racist or not? The formula was challenged in 2013. The Supreme Court struck down the formula, which struck down preclearance, which basically said legislatures go and pass whatever maps you want and let's shift the burden away from the legislatures. Let's put the burden now on civil rights groups to have to sue. But then what the Supreme Court did to try to screw the civil rights groups is basically say, whoa, 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 civil rights group, you're suing way too close to an election. This is called the 
Purcell doctrine. And now we can't do anything as the Supreme Court. So we're just going to let those maps stay in place because it's way too close to the election. Or the Supreme Court says we shouldn't really even be challenging what the legislature is doing. The legislature seems to be doing a fine job. But you add to the mix here in Florida, these anti political gerrymandering provisions in addition to the federal issues. And you have a real mess on your hands. So um, DeSantis, uh, you know, told the legislature, you know, basically by, you know, like like a dictator, pass my map. He drew it himself. They passed his map and the civil rights groups now have sued immediately. And now we'll go through a process where it's in state court. They're challenging it based on a number of factors, including this state law. Um, You know, Popak, this map should be struck down, you know, but I ultimately fear that as we go to the federal processes, what's the Supreme Court going to do? What are the federal courts of appeals going to do following those really bad federal precedents? I think the state courts are going to do the right thing here, but ultimately is the outcome going to be one, uh, are these maps going to be struck down? And two, Are they going to be struck down in time for the elections? Because what's at stake here is that DeSantis has redrawn the map to specifically remove two districts represented by black Democrats. That's what they did. That was the purpose of it. So it's a swing of about plus four to Republicans, and it's blatantly racist. So Popak, what's going on here? Well, the good news is it's going to be litigated in Leon County up in Tallahassee, which is, as you've noted, is a better forum for the challenge to this map. I wanna make this clear. The Republicans in the legislature in the State House of Tallahassee have completely abdicated all responsibility uh, and have now just genuflected to the idol of DeSantis in every way, shape and form. He has taken over that government in a, as you said, in a fascist or dictator way. We'll talk about it in another podcast what he's done to retaliate against Disney, of all things, in exercising its First Amendment right to challenge his don't say gay. He's now retaliated against them this week by taking away their tax, their tax status and their ability to run the government in and around and the property in and around where Disney World resides. That's another example of 65 percent of of the House of the legislature in Florida being controlled by the Republicans and therefore controlled by DeSantis. They are so um, a supplicant to DeSantis that they just turned over completely and abdicated the map making responsibility for redistricting directly to the governor's mansion. They didn't even try. They said, you know what? They literally delegated it back to the governor. You send us the map that you want us to pass and we'll pass it. And that's exactly what they did this week. And that map, as you pointed out, um, completely halves black representation it uh, and retaliates against two very high profile uh, re- uh, Democratic black Democratic leaders in Florida, including Val Demings, the former police chief of Orlando, who sits in Orange County and trying to eliminate or gerrymander around her district. The good news is I have a reasonable modicum of confidence in the Leon County slash Tallahassee state court judges who are often uh, a burr in the saddle of Governor DeSantis because they're not overly Republican, although it's the northern part of the state and that's that part of the state is very Republican. So I think it's a better chance than not, here's a Popak prediction, that this judge, and I have to look up who exactly has been assigned to this case and we'll talk about it on Wednesday or the next pod, They will strike this down under the Florida constitutional provisions that you mentioned and the U.S. constitutional provisions. I think this uh, this plaintiffs group of black voting um, activists who are the plaintiffs properly, strategically chose Leon County instead of the Northern District of Florida federal court, where a lot of those uh, judges owe their political fortune and their careers to Governor DeSantis. And so they they did an end run around that. They said, you know what? Let's go to Tallahassee and Leon County and let's see if we can get a better ruling on that. Could it end up flipping over to a federal matter? It could. But I think it stays for a long time in Leon County. But just to astral project into the future, as you and I like to do, the Supreme Court of the state of Florida is very, very conservative right wing 
And most of them have been appointed by DeSantis or by Governor Scott, the other fascist governor just before him. And I know a couple of the appointees and they're nice people, but they are Federalist Society, right, right wing. A couple came out of Miami who I knew well. But that's it's not going to be great at the Florida Supreme Court level. And then they may I think it gives the, the litigants, the plaintiffs, the right almost two bites at the apple. Let's see how we do with Leon County. Let's see how we do with the Supremes of Florida. And if we don't like it, we'll flip over to Northern District of Florida and we'll file there. Well, we will keep everyone updated on what is happening there. And this is what the radical right extremist governors are want to do. They don't want to play fairly. They want to cheat at every single turn and the stakes cannot be higher. We will keep you updated there. I want to talk about the Department of Justice this week has filed an appeal on behalf of the CDC challenging the Florida District Court order, which prohibited the mask mandate. It was an injunction stopping the mask mandate, declaring that the CDC did not have the power to institute a mask mandate in the public transit. This was a ruling by a judge named Catherine Mazel. We all have kind of now we talked about Catherine Mazel on prior uh, legal AF. So she was appointed. She graduated law school in uh, 2012. Uh, so she was a lawyer for about six to seven years before she was nominated. Um, she was actually confirmed after Trump had lost. She was ranked by a bipartisan group as being unqualified and kind of per se unqualified because she had very little experience, uh, almost no experience as a trial lawyer, as doing cases or anything. She like only that. she only practiced for six or eight months in private practice her entire career, if you want to call it that in the legal profession, following law school, Ben was in federal clerkships in the hermetically sealed chambers of judges. She did three clerkships. She did a six month stint or less, I think, at a national global law firm. And that was it. Now she's qualified to sit and make constitutional and other life altering decisions as a lifetime appointment to the federal bench. So not only did she strike down the CDC's uh, mask rule and public transit, but she did a universal injunction. She did a ruling that affected not just Florida, but no, the entire 49 other states, <laughs> but, but but 49 other states. Yeah. And so, you know, regardless of what your view is on, you know, wearing masks, I, I'm going to put this out there, Popak. Do I like wearing masks? Do I enjoy it? No. Um, do masks feel itchy? Yes. Do masks feel uncomfortable on my face sometimes? Yes. But guess what? We're in a global freaking pandemic. And if the minor inconvenience of wearing a mask based on the scientific data from the agency that we've always trusted for telling us how we stop the spread of communicable diseases says in certain situations like public transit that's very crowded, can you just wear this thing? It may make you uncomfortable for a little bit of time. Hey, when you're eating, you can even take it off. <laughs> when you're eating, you can take it off. Right. Just wear it for a little bit. And for the radical right extremists who want to control the bodies of childbearing persons, for them to say, oh, this is an invasion of my right that you're making me wear a piece of fabric over my, my body, for a small my piece face, of, my, my face body, my for face, a small piece of time. <laughs> oh, oh, no. You know, here's the thing. The Public Health Service Act is the kind of operative statute at play here, which basically says that the CDC is able to kind of make rules in the areas of inspection, fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, and other measures in its judgment that may be necessary. In and its so, judgment. In its judgment that may be right. necessary. So in Catherine Mazel's big ruling, I could break it down for you very quickly. What she basically said is masks, it's a, it's 
just the most bizarre logic in the world. Like masks are not sanitation was how was how she said. So therefore, the statute said sanitation. The masks are not sanitation I'm, and the masks don't work, according to her own scientific views, apparently. Um, and therefore, I'm striking down the mask mandate. And by the way, her ruling does not apply to this piece of to this period of time where there have been vaccines, you know, where things have gotten slightly better with COVID. What her ruling is saying, even in the height of a global pandemic, the CDC doesn't have the ability to do things like yeah, like have masks. That, that's why that's this a is very such a good. Up, that's a very good observation. That's a very very good observation because if left on the books, you're right. Her ruling would completely eviscerate the power of the CDC uh, person, you know, the head of the CDC, which has been delegated by Congress under the statute, the public health statute that you just cited in the face of this pandemic or the next. I hate to break it to everybody. We're not done with pandemics in our lifetime and there will be other ones. And it says specifically, as you read, as you read from it, that the CDC is authorized in it in the director's own judgment. So it puts a tremendous amount of power and authority in the judgment of the agency to protect the spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries by regulating, inspecting, fumigating, disinfecting, and sanitizing. Now, you, we spoke about this provision a year ago on the rent stabilization or rent eviction uh, moratorium. And there was this same, this very same language that was cited. And you and I had a hard time with, well, which one of these fumigation, sanitation applies to people not being evicted from their homes? A terrible event, but we couldn't quite figure out language wise where that fit. This one is not even a close call unless you're Judge Mizell and you pull out some dictionary or you do what's called Google search, because literally at one point in her decision, she said, we need to go to the to the uh, context and contextualizing of what the word sanitation means and sanitary. And so I Googled it. I mean, she didn't quite say it that way, but that's what she that's what her clerks did for her or the briefs for the opposition did for her. And by the way, she ignored. I'll give one example. A surgical mask is technically called a sanitary mask. That is the technical term for a surgical mask. So a mask has a obviously has a sanitary component to it. She might not think it's sanitary or she might have other aspects of the rule that she thinks is wrong. But to twist herself into knots to try to redefine what sanitary is in order to say he doesn't have the ability or she doesn't have the ability as the director of the CDC to impose a mask mandate. That is gymnastics of a level that, you know, that would be tens in, in the Olympics. I've never seen such a thing. So. But then there was that moment and you and I talked about it offline about, well, why is the Biden administration just laying down for this? Because, you know, Jen, Jen Psaki got on and said, well, we're disappointed. We're going to evaluate. And, and, and every airline within the three day period made an announcement, including in flight, that people could drop their masks at that moment. And then we were like, we said it on the show, Ben. We said, I wonder if they're going to appeal this. What are they waiting for? And now they have the Department of Justice has filed. Now, the problem with the appeal location is because because we're back to the Santas, because Judge Mizell sits in the northern district of uh, no, sorry, the middle district of Florida in, ta in the Tampa area. All the appeals go to the 11th Circuit, the 11th Circuit, while not as bad as the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal in terms of being right wing is pretty conservative. I know a number of the judges that started out in Miami and ended up being elevated by, let's say, DeSantis to the Supreme Court of Florida. And then that's a stepping stone to the 11th Circuit when it gets appointed by uh, when it gets appointed by the, whoever the president is. So a number of those 11th Circuit judges ultimately trace their political fortunes back through DeSantis or through Scott. And so it's not I'm not that confident the 11th Circuit, we're going to get a great ruling. But then, of course, we're off to the Supremes, which, you know, on vaccine in the military, they've sort of been in favor of science and appropriate values. But on masks, they've been all over the map. So I don't What do you think the Supremes do about the mask mandate when it comes back to them? 
See, I think with this area, when it comes to the CDC's rulemaking authority for masks in this discrete setting, even with a radical right extremist court, for them to remove that power from the CDC would ha- would be such a slippery slope, even for their radical right extremist agenda, because you're basically saying that the organization that is there to help the safety in issues involving interstate commerce, you know, states are the ones who are responsible for public health issues on a state by state level. That's why all of these issues are always usually like the governors in different states have different health mandates or mask mandates for specific states. But when a disease can travel across the borders, that's really the only area where the CDC actually comes into play. And so its ability to make these rules is actually very narrow, but it involves interstate commerce, but it's incredibly important. And the ruling here that, you know, my, the, my her last name's Mizell. It seems uh, sounds a bit like Mizell. <laughs> so I have a hard time getting over that. But her rule in a very narrowly circumscribed setting, if we say, well, the mask mandate was going to go out of effect anyway, probably early May, based on what Biden's extension, you know, they extended it to, to early May. Things have gotten better. It is a little bit odd that you can not wear a mask. There's no mask mandates in pretty much any state inside anymore. So why, when I have to go into the airplane, do I have to wear it? Well, the CDC has said that in public transit, that's a very unique setting. But I could see at least the argument of people saying, that doesn't really make all that much sense anymore. I can go into a crowded supermarket, but not the airplane. But that's well, not also what's dropping at the dr- dr- dropping the mask for snacking as you know, and, and and there's no man, there's other problems too, right? There's no mandate that it be a K95 or N95 mask. It can be any old piece of cloth, but, but you're right. Go on to your point about yeah, that, the Biden not administration not here. allowing what, it to stay on the What's bus, at right? stake here is that for any future pandemic or whenever the pandemic occurred, that the CD, that according to this order, the CDC doesn't have the ability to make very common sense recommendations in this area. And every time the CDC wants to act in its capacity to help public health on an interstate commerce level, it will be struck down. So it creates horrible and scary precedent and basically completely uh, takes away anything the CDC can do unless it's circumscribed into one of those like four things like sanitation and, you know, and there's other things we mentioned. Well, wait, wait, and just the last point, I joked about it, um, sort of gallows humor with uh, Karen on Wednesday. Basically, Mizell, Mycellus, Mizell, whatever her name is, the judge ruled effectively that the Center for Disease Control cannot control disease. I, I mean, it is it is that simple. And, um, you know, it's I'm sure she was she's been championed, you know, in all the places that you and I don't reside and don't look like Fox News and things. I'm sure she's now some sort of champion, you know, of 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 right wing freedom. But it's it's a terrible decision. And I'm hoping that you're right, that when it eventually leapfrogs the 11th Circuit ends up at even this Supreme Court, that they will not totally eviscerate the powers of the CDC in the midst of a pandemic or epidemic. You know, I want to talk about Alex Jones and his bankruptcy in a second, but I do want to mention this. I think it's very important how we message um, masks in, in general. I think it's not that we love masks or that we want to put masks on everybody and that there's some weird, bizarre, like, Fetish, fetish involving masks right. that exist. Right. Like, I think that it's fair to say what I said at the beginning that nobody, you know, that it's, it's, a, it is very, it's a pain in the ass sometimes to wear masks and it is uncomfortable and it is difficult sometimes to see our children and people have to wear masks and we don't get to see their beautiful smiles. I get that, but I rather have a minor inconvenience 
you know, to make sure that I'm improving the health and I'm helping out and I'm doing my part. Our, our ancestors have had to make far bigger and broader sacrifices for this country than having to temporarily wear a mask when we're in crowded spaces. And we need to really frame this radical right anti-mask agenda as weird, as dangerous, as, as strange as it is, and as unhealthy and as kind of disgusting as it is that these are actually very unsanitary human beings who, you know, who want to spread diseases. It's a very strange, it's a very strange position. Speaking of, speaking of weird, unsanitary, and really strange, Let's go to Alex Jones. Let's talk about Alex <laughs> Jones and Alex Jones. Um, here's an interesting fact about Alex Jones that I didn't realize. So Alex Jones, we've talked about these cases where uh, the family members who lost loved ones in the Sandy Hook massacre in Newton, Connecticut, uh, they sued Alex Jones because Alex Jones said that uh, their children who died and the families were crisis actors and that Sandy Hook was where 26 people were killed, was made up and, and didn't exist. And he repeated it over and over again on Infowars and on his TV shows and his digital streaming shows. And the family member sued in Connecticut, family member sued him in Texas and Alex Jones' response to this litigation was basically that obstruction, hiding documents, not showing up to depositions, just literally not responding. What I was shocked about to learn in these bankruptcy filings I'll talk about in a second is that he claims to have spent about $10 million on legal fees in connection with these proceedings where he hasn't done anything and he hasn't showed up and he hasn't appeared for deposition. So how the hell did he spend $10 million? But what had previously happened because Alex Jones was not participating in these lawsuits filed against him for defamation is that he was found to be liable. He was there was a default judgment when someone doesn't participate in the litigation. There could be a default entered against him, meaning you lose the case. He's found liable and responsible for his conduct in defaming these family members. So what was left to be decided? Just the damages. How many, how much money would compensate the family for the horrific, egregious acts by Alex Jones in brutally defaming them and yeah. saying that they didn't lose their children and that they're acting and the trauma that he put them through. And in my view, that is, there's no dollar, by the way, that could ever compensate a grieving family for the torture Alex Jones put them through. But we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that a jury would likely award these yeah. families. And members. punitive damages. There could be many, many multiples of that, as we talked about in the case involving Tesla last week. And so these family members sued Alex Jones, they sued Infowars, they sued a number of his other entities. And his main kind of holding company that holds all of his intellectual property is this Infowars LLC. So we were headed to a trial that was going to be taking place in next, next week. Um, it's going to be very soon. And on the eve of the trial for damages, Alex Jones put Infowars, the company, the holding company, into bankruptcy and filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, chapter, there's a difference between Chapter 7 and Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I won't belabor and fully go into it here, but we like to educate on legal AF. So, Chapter 7, you really think of like an individual's liquidation bankruptcy. So all of these non-exempt assets are basically sold off. Whatever is left is distributed to creditors. The individual gets a blank slate. They get horrible, horribly dinged on their credit report for seven years as having that bankruptcy, but all of their creditors are out and then that individual goes out of debt. Whereas chapter 11 is a reorganization, usually of a corporation, where there's a plan that's created with certain debtors, and then the 
then the debt's wiped away and the corporation can then kind of proceed and exist. Yeah. And in these chapter 11 cases too, a United States trustee is appointed and the United States trustee oversees the bankruptcy proceedings as well to make sure that there's no fraud and that they approve the plan and that they could object yeah. to the plan before the judge. They, um, they represent, the trustee represents the bankruptcy estate, which is an entity that is created by the filing which is the is the organization in bankruptcy is now an estate in bankruptcy and the trustee is the trustee over that estate in in the dialogue with the judge over the plan of reorganization the creditors committee and all of that but you're right the 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 goal here in a chapter 11 is that they come out it's called coming out of chapter 11 and get to reorganize in order to be a going concern. Whereas, as you said, in chapter seven, the entity is liquidated and no longer comes back. So he thinks he's coming back. He just wants to get, you know, all of the crammed down some sort of debt plan. So people take cents on the dollar um, or whatever money he has in the bankruptcy. But you, you'll go on and talk about why the Department of Justice, which oversees the trustee program, and the families are so concerned about this filing and are questioning whether it's a bad faith filing. So we talked about bad faith bankruptcy filings before on Legal AF, actually in also in Texas, yeah. where, yes. where the NRA filed uh, for bankruptcy and it was challenged as a bad faith bankruptcy. That is what we will be seeing here as well with Alex Jones. He filed in the federal bankruptcy court in Houston. Immediately, the trustee representing the U.S. government who represents, as you said, the bankruptcy estate has raised serious questions about the validity of the filing, one wondering also why Alex Jones individually did not uh, seek bankruptcy and did not file for bankruptcy individually. You know, why the other entities that Alex Jones controls were sued did not seek bankruptcy. And was this just a sham filing? Because a bankruptcy filing stays, it temporarily stops and delays uh, a litigation with that entity from uh, proceeding until the bankruptcy is resolved. And so one of the other issues that comes into play here, though, too, in bankruptcies, though, is is a certain claim dischargeable in bankruptcy as well. So if it is, if the claims actually proceed through a bankruptcy and it's not a bad faith bankruptcy, there's still another analysis that would need to take place of if it is intentional conduct, often like defamation or an assault or a battery or other types of intentional torts like that, as opposed to negligence, oftentimes those types of claims are also not dischargeable uh, in bankruptcy. But then you also go to the issue that Alex Jones hasn't declared bankruptcy and the other entities haven't declared bankruptcy. And so there's concerns that's a bad faith filing. There's also concerns that Alex Jones is uh, putting money in all these other entities and basically engaged in all these fraudulent conveyances. And so one of the things that the families have also been filing and are bringing is a claim that uh, there's fraudulent conveyance taking place under a Texas fraudulent conveyance statute that Alex is hiding his money in shell yep. corporations and avoiding paying them because and the he same made thing real money. In 2019, $78 million from the uh, products that he sold. Um, he's lost some money since the filing of it, but still, you know, that's like pandemic, you know, decreasing sales anyway, like $58 million last year in, uh, in, in his products. No. And, you know, and his this lawyers, what, too, kind of gloating, calling him the like he's the McDonald's of conspiracy theorists. They called him something stupid like that at the hearing. So, Popak, tell us uh, more about what's going on here. Yeah, but no, I think we unpacked it there pretty good. No, no, I think you did. Then we'll talk next about him now at the same time, in the same breath as trying to avoid ultimate liability and playing a shell game with his assets with these fraudulent transfers and putting the holding company into potential chapter 11 bankruptcy, while at the same time, the entity under the holding company is being is about to go to trial and defamation and has already been hit with a million dollar fine by the Texas judge 
everything's been filed in Texas by these families from Sandy Hook because he resides in Texas and it was just, you know, easier not to fight over jurisdiction. And so they went where he lived and, you know, the federal judge there, uh, the, I'm sorry, the state court judge there has nailed him with a, over a million dollar fine, both him personally and another entity that is not in bankruptcy, but is related to the entity that is in bankruptcy. So this whole shell game of assets, the families, you know, to, to not be left with the Pyrrhic victory of a giant judgment but a paper judgment that they can't enforce because they can't find his assets, that would be just you know adding insult to injury again. So they're trying now to cut him off at the pass by objecting in, uh, to bankruptcy filings because they assume he's doing it for a reason. He's doing it so he can pull out his pockets and say, see, I have no money. And the money that you, you know, you're going to get a judgment against one entity, but then how are you ever going to go and pierce what we call pierce the veil and go through all of my other entities to get to me? Now, fortunately, he's a named uh, defendant in these cases, but he'll say, I don't have any money in my own name. I have a thousand LLCs and, and corporations, and I'm sure he does, in, in which his house is in one, his car is in his another, you know, his, his retirement fund is in a third, his whatever. I'm sure he's got everything he thinks bulletproof locked away. And now these, it's now not, this is what you and I do. It's not just winning and coming out with a judgment and celebrating, it's now collecting on that if you're on the plaintiff side and getting and connecting the money to the victims. And that's a whole nother art that's not taught in law school that you and I have mastered and do every day on behalf of our clients. That's the next step. So while he's doing that, knowing that, and I'll transition here for us, knowing that Ali Alexander, his close buddy, is already giving testimony to the grand jury, knowing that, his number one lieutenant who, who, who helped attack, it was the first one in to the Capitol attack, has already been arrested and is facing, uh, and facing trial. Knowing all of that, he has come forward with a letter to the Department of Justice saying, hey, I was at the Willard Hotel and I was on the ellipse and I helped, uh, I helped organize certain things related to the attack. I'm willing to come in and give you my testimony in exchange for 100% full immunity, get out of jail free pass. When when would you like to meet with me? So let's talk about what you think about that and why he's doing it. You know, our system is built, I think, fortunately, but also we see the unfortunate side on good faith dealings and following the law. And with these, you know, actors, these people who play the role of villain, who simply have no regard whatsoever for our legal process, we really see how it could all be manipulated. I, I don't want to belabor this point, Popak, but I, it may be worth just mentioning it here because I feel like it's it's a bit related as well. Um, you know, Donald Trump filed some supplemental uh, briefing in a BS federal lawsuit he filed against Tish James to delay her civil investigation taking place against the Trump organization, Trump and his family members for all of their fraud in their uh, valuations and uh, of, of their different entities and the investigation that she's doing there. And that is to like delay and slow down her investigation has no good faith basis to even be filed. Um, this is at the same time she, Tish James, is seeking a contempt order against Donald Trump for not turning over documents. And Donald Trump basically says, I don't have the documents. You're asking me for documents. Actually, it's the Trump organization that has the documents. I don't have the documents. Then you go to the Trump organization. They go, we don't have the documents. This organization has the documents. And so why I'm mentioning all of that is that you have people who don't follow the rules of the litigation and don't follow. And, and so how do you take what um, is even happening here by Alex Jones in any way, seriously, him approaching the government for immunity. That's probably more PR stunts for his TV show. I agree. You know, it's total bullshit. It's a way for him to, you know, you have to be so careful as the government even dealing with him because the investigation 
by Merrick Garland and the DOG, DOJ has been airtight, almost no leaks whatsoever. The moment Alex Jones starts talking to them, the leaks that are occurring are from Alex Jones <laughs> and people like Ali Alexander leaking oh, yeah. the people who they're talking to. That's not coming from the DOJ that Alex Jones is talking to the DOJ. Alex Jones is leaking that he's talking to the DOJ. He's doing that to promote himself, to distract what's going on from Sandy Hook. And ultimately, the DOJ may not care at all about giving this guy immunity, and they probably would never give this guy to. immunity. And he's floating it out there to New York Times reporters. So to answer your question directly, but a bit of a circuitous way, is that he's the one, in my view, who's leaking that. I don't think there's any serious uh, you know, views of ever giving him immunity. But I think he's also trying to, in his own way, blackmail people on his own, you know, who people, his own co-conspirators to help him out, to give him more money, to protect him. That's what's going on there. And then what we see with Sandy Hook is just more delays by him and him in his own way with $10 million in legal fees. And he defaulted on the case. It tells you that he's spending his money on lawyers, likely creating the shell companies to hide his assets versus actually litigate the case. That's his plan and his strategy. And we yeah. see that, you know, we're seeing it here in a very glaring way, but stuff like this happens a lot with wealthy people. So you're, I, I 100% agree with you. I think this is all a publicity stunt. First of all, the prosecutor, I want to talk about a new prosecutor who's joined the Department of Justice team and why it's really, really important. It will answer the question that many of our audience have asked, which, which had been until about a month ago when we reported on the Department of Justice and the grand jury process in Washington um, about what is the Department of Justice doing beyond the 700 that they're prosecuting who actually participated in the, in the um, insurrection that attacked the Capitol. What about the planners? What about the organizers? What about Trump? We have some answers to that. And I think our audience will be happy about it. And it's kind of nestled within the Alex Jones reporting. Just to remind everyone, Alex Jones was at the ellipse. Alex Jones helped plan the ellipse uh, speech for Trump. Alex Jones participated in the ellipse. Alex Jones was at the Willard Hotel, which was their bunker that that uh, he and Bannon and Giuliani and Powell and others, um, Flynn, came in and out of on Jan 5 in order to organize all of the, what Jamie Raskin has now called, uh, and we'll talk about next, the 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 inside coup led by the president of the United States against the vice president and Congress, because that is how the Jan 6 committee is going to present this. And Jamie Raskin gave us a little bit of an insight to that. We'll talk about in the next segment. What, what was Alex Jones's role? The Jan 6 committee has concluded. And Alex Jones, just to remind everybody, testified in front of the Jan 6 committee. Now, he says on his Infowar show or whatever it is that he took the fifth 100 times. But he answered some questions. So he already went in. And what is the linkage between Alex Jones and all of this? It's the following, that he, Carolyn Wren, W-R-E-N, a Trump aide who worked in the Trump organization, Cindy Chaffian, who, was, who helped organize the First Amendment Praetorians and their security detail around the ellipse, and Julie Fancelli, who is an heir to the Publix uh, supermarket uh, 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 fortune. That group, Alex Jones at the top with that group, financed 80% of the ellipse events. That's one. The second thing is that, uh, that, that we learned from the reporting off of Alex Jones uh, saying, if you give me a full immunity, I'll give you whatever little information I'll, I'll provide to you, is that Thomas Windom, W-I-N-D-O-M, a, a very successful federal prosecutor based in Maryland, it's now reported has been added to the Department of Justice team, and he will oversee the entire Jan 6 investigation as the front line, as the line prosecutor. There's two groups of prosecutors that are working simultaneously who will now report into Thomas Wyndham. One is the group that we've all heard about and you and I have reported on <clears throat> for the last six or eight months. That's the group of prosecutors that are investigating the Jan 6 riot and everybody that was involved with the Jan 6 riot. Then there's the second team of federal prosecutors who are looking at the conspiracy case 
And that's the case that gets closer and closer to Trump and his inner circle and the related issues related to the the, uh, forged and fraudulent electors in the battleground states and that submission. And those two teams are now being supervised by a brand new prosecutor who have been brought in to work with the different departments of the Department of Justice, the National Security Division of the Department of Justice, for instance, to try to um, decide when and whether to prosecute people like Donald Trump. And, and so the good news is for those that said they're not doing a darn thing, they are. And, and whether it's a, exactly at the level that the Jan 6 committee is, remember, the Jan 6 committee are not prosecutors. They are not presenting evidence and evaluating evidence on a prosecutorial scale, the one that Karen talks about with me a lot on, on the Wednesday podcast, of beyond a reasonable doubt and the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. They don't have to. We don't want them to. They're on a completely different standard of, you know, beyond, you know, uh, preponderance of the evidence. And that's what they're going to present in June during the hearings. And that's what they're going to deliver the Jan 6 committee in their report before the midterm elections in the fall or the late or the late summer. But that's the Alex Jones thing. I think you're right. He's starting a fire in the corner in order to distract from all of his bankruptcy problems, to make himself relevant, to continue to generate money and put cash in his pocket. And there is no way that Thomas Wyndham, the new prosecutor, or anybody else on that team, another prediction, is going to give him immunity to get any information out of him because they have what they need against Alex Jones from his lieutenant, from uh, Owen Schreier, who was his first lieutenant who worked on InfoWars, who's going to jail. To Alex, to Ali Alexander, who seems more worried about his personal liberty than than I think Alex Jones does, um, I, they'll they'll do it without him. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones, for your offer, uh, but but we pass, and I think that's what we're going to see in the next set of reporting related to the Department of Justice. The January sixth committee hearings, as you mentioned, Michael Popak will start in June, and Congressman Jamie Raskin says the revelations at these hearings, quote, will blow the roof off the House. We're going to talk about Jan 6th updates, and we're going to talk about the Marjorie Taylor Greene insurrection hearings. But before doing that, I want to talk about our partner, Athletic Greens. This podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the health and wellness company that makes comprehensive daily nutrition really simple. Everybody knows on Legal AF and the Midas Touch podcast how transformative Athletic Greens and its product AG1 has been on my life. Before Athletic Greens, I was taking vitamins and minerals and I was taking gummies and I was taking the pills and I thought they were working, but they were not. I was not taking what I needed. And then I discovered about four months ago, Athletic Greens, if you've been watching Illegal AF or the Midas Touch podcast, you've seen for yourself, my health journey as I began taking Athletic Greens. What I do is I take the Athletic Greens powder. It's a green superfood powder. I take it, I put it in my cup, I shake it up, I drink it each morning, put some water in it, shake it, drink it with some water. And before you know it, I've got all the energy I need. I have all the vitamins and minerals I need for the day. I feel that I can conquer the day. With one tasty scoop of AG1, it contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more in one convenient daily serving. The special blend of high quality bioavailable ingredients in a scoop of AG1 work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet, support energy and focus, aid with gut health and digestion and support a healthy immune system, effectively replacing multiple products or pills with one healthy and delicious drink. It's lifestyle friendly. So whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy free or gluten free, it's for you. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while keeping it tasting good. Please join the movement of legal AFers, of the Midas Mighty, of athletes, of lifeletes, of moms, dads, 
rookies, first timers, and everyone in between taking ownership of their daily health and focusing on the nutritional products they really need in the simplest manner possible. That's essential nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you an immune supporting free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. With your first purchase, if you visit athleticgreens.com slash legal AF today. Again, simply visit athleticgreens.com slash legal AF and take control of your health and give AG1 a try. There are so many Legal AF podcast listeners who will send me DMs or emails thanking me for the recommendation, saying that taking AG1 has changed their lives, has given them energy that makes them feel great, and that makes me so proud that we sell products on here that people love. Athleticgreens.com slash Legal AF. And I want to talk to you as well about Aura Frames. This podcast is brought to you by Aura Frames. The gifts you make mean the most. So this year, turn your family's past into the perfect Mother's Day present with a connected frame from Aura. Named the number one digital frame by Wirecutter and selected as one of Oprah's favorite things three years running, it is guaranteed to make mom smile. An Aura Frame brings all your photos and videos together in one gorgeous high-resolution display where mom can really enjoy them. Also known as not a group text or on social media. Preload any frame with meaningful memories and a special message that will appear as soon as it's set up. Invite the whole family to add to the frame and feel close from anywhere. From now until Mother's Day, listeners can save on the perfect gift and get up to $40 off while supplies last by visiting Aura Frames, that's A-U-R-A-F-R-A-M-E-S dot com slash Legal AF. That's A-U-R-A-F-R-A-M-E-S, AuraFrames dot com slash Legal AF. Terms and conditions apply. I have two Aura Frames in my house. It was so easy to put the photos. You have one too, Popak. It was so easy to load the photos in there. It looks beautiful. In the past, when I had these frames, like when I tried ordering them years ago, like the quality didn't look good, and it just did. I didn't. It it didn't look good in my house. This looks great. Everyone compliments it. I'll tell you one thing about Aura because I'm glad I'm glad they're back as a sponsor because I liked them from the very beginning. It is that app. That's their that's their better mousetrap. That app they have is so seamless. Is so easy to use that I'll be out at an event or you know some life experience where there, there's a photo, and it's just so easy directly from your photo library to go to the app and immediately send it to your frame. By the time you get home, it's already rotating on your frame from the event you just left. It really is, I think, in for that market of uh, of uh, digital uh, frames. I think best. this is the best one out there because of that app. The best. All right, let's get into it. January 6th committee updates. And then let's talk about the Marjorie Taylor Greene insurrection hearings. First, January committee updates. As I mentioned before I read those ads, uh, we have uh, Congressman Raskin says, quote, the revelations we will be discussing in June are going to, quote, blow the roof off the House. I believe which is what the insurrectionists were trying to do. There's irony there. Um, The January 6th committee has now interviewed approximately 850 individuals who gave statements under penalty of perjury and one individual who did not give a statement under penalty of perjury and likely for good reason, because he wouldn't be able to withstand the most basic of questioning, although he is a traitor for, for his a traitor and a coward, uh, Kevin McCarthy. And the recent revelations after Kevin McCarthy completely denied, I never told Donald Trump that he should resign. I would never make a comment like that. Well, those revelations were printed in a new book written by two New York Times writers um, that was leaked in connection with the book. 
Kevin McCarthy said, I never said that. That's fake news. And then immediately after, guess what drops? On Rachel Maddow, the tapes get dropped by New York Times, where Kevin McCarthy was speaking with Republican leadership on a conference call. This was January 10th. And what did he say? He said, I am going to speak to Donald Trump and tell him to resign. I think Donald Trump should resign. That was one tape. The, the other tape that was that was revealed was he said that Donald Trump, by the way, by the way, t- tapes are a terrible thing for liars. Absolutely. And the other <laughs> thing he said that Donald Trump told him that Donald Trump believed that he was responsible for January 6th and that he was at fault for January 6th. Those two things are on tape. We will keep talking about that each and every day at Midas Touch and Legal AF. But that's like atomic bomb level evidence, Popak. Does, do you think people fully understand the implications of that? Or is that just lost in the noise of the Republicans are a fascist, traitorous party and that yeah. they're corrupt criminals it, and that's just who it, they are right now? It gets lost in the noise, which is why the Brothers podcast and all the other podcasts in the stable of Midas Touch are so important because we bring it front and center. We're not going to stop talking about that. You're not. We're not going to stop talking about the link between Ginny Thomas and all of the QAnon and all of the cultists that that attacked the Capitol um, and her and her her marriage to to uh, to Clarence. We're not going to stop talking about these things. But they want us to stop talking about these things. This would be the equivalent then. What you just described would be like if there was an audio tape of Benedict Arnold. At the time, you know, betraying his country. I mean, the, this is the level that we're talking about. And I'm sorry, and you're exactly right. It gets lost in the transom and the morass of all of the digital feeds that get plugged into everybody's head, as you talked about the 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 uh, competing chihuahuas that are out there, and or the direct mainline feed into the arm. I think is another way you put it, which I yeah. Agree yeah. With. For those who are just tuning in to Legal Air for the first time, with <laughs> we Popak are not two talking, chihuahuas. <laughs> what Popak is talking about is the way the media presents things. Is this false competition where you elevate two sides, one democracy, one fascism, as though it's just a normal Democrat Republican conversation. And you have two chihuahuas talking at each other like, and that's how 90% of the mainstream media does, you know, does it. The largest platform mainstream media, Fox News, though, they're just injecting fascism directly into the veins of India. Yeah, they're mainlining the vein. Now, here's what I thought was the most interesting about and most um, heartwarming, I guess that's the word, as a true believer in democracy and a protector of our republic, as we are on this show and on the other shows, is Jamie Raskin gave a preview of what the June hearing is going to be and the presentation. He's not at my alma mater, Georgetown, he gave it at. At, at, at a Georgetown conference on um, religion and law. I forget the topic. As a guest speaker, he didn't hold back. They're not gagged. They have not gagged themselves. They feel they have to talk in the public in advance of the delivery of the report to be a counterweight to what Trump does every day and Meadows and and uh, McCarthy and the rest of them. Lie, and, I, lie. I, and I'm glad about that. I'm glad that they're out there talking about their report. And Jamie Raskin, who's kind of the lead prosecutor for the Jan 6 committee, he said point blank, this was an insider coup the likes that we've never seen, where a president to cling to power had a had a coup arranged against the vice president, against Mike Pence and against Congress in order to create the the framework for first the insurrection to be used as a cover for the coup, then use the Insurrection Act of 1807 to to put down rebellion, which rebellion means democratic voices, to take then control, to throw the entire thing to the House under the 12th Amendment, an amendment we never talk about, and to have Mike Pence do his bidding. And the most chilling thing that Raskin said to him that he's heard out of 800 interviews is that the Secret Service agents reported that Mike Pence, even Mike Pence, Sensing the coup, and this is Raskin's view, refused to get into a car to be whisked away from the Capitol, knowing that his place to stop the coup was to stay in the Capitol. And the quote 
from Raskin, from the Secret Service agent, is that Mike Pence, told to get in the car by the Secret Service agent, said, I am not getting in that car. He, Raskin said that's the most chilling six words he's heard out of the entire set of testimony. And he took that to mean that the light went off in Pence's head, that Trump was trying to get Pence out of there in order for this chaos to ensue, for the Insurrection Act to be invoked, for martial law, we're going to talk about that next with Marjorie Taylor Greene, for martial law to be invoked, and for this president desperate to cling on to cling to power to try to overthrow the legitimacy of the Biden win. Because what were they trying to do as part of their plan? And we talked about this with John Eastman, um, who I believe were co-conspirators, were all of these traitorous Republican senators who were objecting to the certification process. You know, there's a weird law in the books. Obviously, the Constitution as the president of the Senate, the vice president counts the electoral votes, and it's a ministerial act, right, where they just literally count it and say, the states have submitted it. Here's what the state said. Um, the Electoral Count Act of 1887 is this very strange law that was passed, which is very vague. Um, But what it basically says is it gives the power to members of the House and Senate to object, sustain the objection, agree with the objection. If there is a new slate of electors that's approved by the state government, those electors could replace the electors where the objections were sustained. And and, And state houses are controlled by Republicans, by and large. And so they were the states were submitting the fraudulent electors that they sent to the National Archivist for processing, which then went to the House. And so the idea was, was that the Republican senators were going to object to the legitimate electors, the Republican senators and House of Representatives was going to object to that. And because, though, the governors who Trump, that's why Trump was threatening the governors of the Republican states to support the unlawful electors. But because that didn't happen, the plan switched and hinged on Pence, basically saying, based on the objections, I don't have the ability to certify the result. So you take Pence out, uh, literally, you whisk him out. You throw the elections into chaos. The idea is it goes to the House of the, the House of Representatives and it goes to the sorry, the state legislatures are the ones in the state houses would ultimately, you know, decide. And if the state houses in these areas where there were disputes which le- leaned Republican, then it would overturn the election in favor of Trump. But they so, needed Pence to get in that car and he refused. They needed Pence to get into the car and they needed Pence not to, you know, engage in the ministerial act as the vice president. Had Pence just simply said, hey, you know, there's way too much confusion here and got into the car, the United States of America would be likely an authoritarian country. We would have a civil war. That's what would have happened that day. Yeah. That's how close it came. Yeah. And that's why they had backup plans too, including killing Mike Pence. That's why it was hang Mike Pence was the plan when it was clear that Mike Pence wasn't going to go along with the plan. And the Republicans knew this. Kevin McCarthy knew this. That's why on January 10th, Kevin McCarthy said, I'm going to call President Trump and tell him to resign. That's why in the audio tape, Liz Cheney, Kevin McCarthy, the Republicans are talking about the 25th Amendment. That's why there's, you know, Steve Scalise, who's a big Trump supporter um, publicly, but privately, we have the information of him saying that Trump should be removed from office. But you have this cowardice, this obsequiousness, this traitorousness of the Republican Party, whereas this is what they're saying privately. This is how fascism and authoritarianism is created by people like Kevin McCarthy doing, you know, doing just that. I'm sure there were people behind Hitler's back in his inner circle that were talking negatively about him, but they never stood up to him. And we know what happened historically from that. So if if that is the preview for what, and that was just one comment where, where Jamie Raskin summarized, you know, a year's worth of investigation by saying it was an insider coup led by the president against the vice president of Congress and ultimately the American people. And the six most chilling words are those of, of, 
of uh of Pence get strap in. You think you got a half a million people that watch the Midas Touch Twitter feed or Twitch feed of Marjorie Taylor Green? Wait till you see the numbers. And if we do the live commentary about it, when the week long or more hearings in June start, I might I might have to take a sabbatical just to sit and watch these with you. Hopak, we may have to hold you to that uh, (laughs) sabbatical, but that's what's going on there. Those are the big Jan 6 updates. And lawmakers are looking at the Electoral Count Act again. They are looking at the Insurrection Act again. These things that are being used by, uh, you know, as the Constitution was stress tested, seeing where these points of weakness were that tried to be unlawfully exploited by Republicans. And as uh, David Carter, federal judge in California, said, this was a coup in search of a legal theory. And the legal theories they searched for, one was the Electoral Count Act of 1887 that I discussed. The other was the Insurrection Act that you discussed, you know, and trying to pervert and destroy our Constitution. That's why when these radical right extremists hoist up the Constitution, the flag in performative ways. They use the flag, the radical right extremists, to beat and kill police officers. That is how they use the flag. They use the Constitution to allow guns to spread rampantly in our schools and allow school shootings and protect conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones. That's not what our Constitution is for. That's not they, what the values and They don't want to take response. The, the people that vote for that party, by and large, and I have friends that are that do that, do not want to take responsibility for the moral and ethical issues and dilemmas that are created by voting for a Trump. They don't want to acknowledge that they are responsible for the first time in 200 years for the for Congress to have to, recon- to consider changes to martial law, to the Insurrection Act of 1807, to the Electoral Count Act. These are Civil War era law in our books that I would have thought I would have went to my own personal grave undisturbed in the last 200 years. I did not think we would have a presidency that would require a reevaluation of of the law of the land after the assassination of President Lincoln and the and the uh, the combination of the Union again after the Confederacy. I never and they're okay with that. They fly their Trump 2024 flags. I've got them in my neighborhood. I ride by them. I see them on their trucks. But the, do they ever think about the implications for the survival of our democracy because they have pledged allegiance to a madman? And, and I hate to be cruel, but just for a moment, I think I've earned that right. I don't know how old Trump is. What is he, pushing 80? And I know everyone's going to say, well, Biden's older. It doesn't matter. Eventually and soon, because that's the way longevity works, Trump's going to be dead. Trump's not going to be alive because he's going to die of natural causes. I don't know if he's going to be 85 or he's going to be 90. And then what? And then what? Do they Are they going to wait around for his coming back, his resurrection? I, I mean, he's going to be gone in a very short a period of time, five years or 10 years, not soon enough for me, but eventually he'll be gone. And what are these people going to do? Who is going to be their new Messiah that they're going to follow towards fascism? That's the scary part. It's not that we've now identified Trump and have him in a box and are starting to pin him down like Gulliver in all of these prosecutions. The question is, who is the next one? Is it is it DeSantis? Is it whoever? And that is why Midas Touch and the Midas Mighty are so important, because we've already Trump is a we're turning the page on Trump one way or the other. He doesn't win in 2024. But who comes next? to follow in his footsteps and pick up the mantle from these people that have supported him. And that's why you have to call it out and you have to condemn it and you have to stand up and you have to be a leader if you truly care about our democracy. Because it is obviously the heir apparent is DeSantis. Um, DeSantis is smarter than Donald Trump. He's a savvier political maneuverer. He's a savvier executive than Trump. Trump is not a good executive. 
and you have Governor DeSantis, who clearly has authoritarian leanings, who is increasingly acting like a dictator within the state, and that is how he will um, desire to run the country. And that's why we have to call it out at every single turn. So let's talk, though, about the Marjorie Taylor Greene insurrection hearing. It streamed live on the Midas Touch YouTube channel, in addition to some other places where it was live. And a lot of our viewers, a lot of listeners, you know, wanted to know what, what was I watching? Like, what was this proceeding? Well, it was an administrative proceeding before a judge by the name of Judge Charles R. Bedreau Jr., who is in the office of the State of Administrative Hearings for the state of Georgia. He's an administrative judge. So it's an administrative hearing before an administrative judge to disqualify an individual from oh. being Popeye. Oh, you raised a caveat. Finger? I got um, a point of order. Point He's of order. Going, he, the only thing this administrative judge can do, and we're going to talk about the whole thing backwards. You know, let me make, make the explanation, eight. Popak. He can make a referral oh, to yes. Brad Ryan. Yeah, I, I hit the points, right. Popak. I, right. I got to go there. But the hearing <laughs> is to disqualify. And what you, you, you have no faith in me, Popak, in knowing the law. <laughs> I have so much faith in oh you that gosh. every Saturday you I show up. up. Re- that finger showed put, no faith. I put. I don't have a yellow card. You put a I, finger I, up for I, no faith. I, I have. It was the. It was the right finger. It was a. a for those that don't watch this on YouTube, it was a, an appropriate finger. I just wanted to make sure that people knew it's a report and recommendation to the secretary. Exactly. Of State. Okay. He makes right. a report or a referral <laughs> to the secretary of state, Brad Raffensperger who can accept or reject that referral because the secretary of state in Georgia oversees the electoral process. That's why Trump threatened Brad Raffensperger and said, find me 11,000 blah, blah, blah votes because Raffensperger oversees the election process. So what does that mean? That means even if this judge found one way or the other, the recommendation would still go to Brad Raffensperger who could accept or reject that recommendation. And so that's a weird process. It is a weird process. <laughs> I mean, there, there's no, it, it, it's not, this is not in a normal court. It is not in a federal court. It is not in the Georgia traditional state court systems. It's not in front of a jury. That's not what this proceeding is. The 14th Amendment Section three has really never been litigated before, which basically says if you're an insurrectionist, you can't run for office or you'd be disqualified from running from office. There was a subsequent law that gave immunity to insurrectionists of the Civil War that they could go back and run for office that gave them immunity there so that we could heal as a nation purportedly back in the, you know, back in the late 1880s. So that law was passed. And there's been a dispute amongst federal courts, whether that law, which granted immunity, if you want to call it immunity for uh, insurrectionists of the civil war for Confederates to run for Congress, if that applied to insurrectionists in the future, a Georgia federal court found that that law does not supersede the constitution and that it was not meaning it did not give immunity to future insurrectionists, that future insurrectionists, they could be challenged. And then the court in Madison Cawthorn's challenge in North Carolina, that judge found that this immunity was given to all future insurrectionists, but that's being challenged in the appeals court there. So because of the ruling in federal court in Georgia saying that uh, all future insurrectionists cannot have their uh, cannot have their ability to run for office challenged, we had this administrative proceeding. Now, administrative proceedings happen a lot to challenge maybe someone's qualification, maybe someone registers for the wrong party or whatever, and no one hears about these administrative hearings. They don't, they're not widely attended. That's why if you notice the room it was in, it looks, I heard people saying like, that looks like the back room of like a, 
you know, whatever. I'm like, yeah, it's, at the, a, weird at the room. DM, it's a weird room. At the DMV. At the That's DMV. like the hearing room at the DMV. Right? Exactly. It's a weird location. <laughs> it's a weird proceeding because people don't know. There hasn't been said whether the 14th Amendment Section 3 is self, self-activating. Is it Congress's job to disqualify its own members? Is it a federal judge's job to disqualify? Is it if somebody is convicted? Um, so, but all of those issues, those legal issues are actually still in play. And that's what Marjorie Taylor Greene's lawyer was arguing too, even though they're in this forum, is that this forum still doesn't really have the right to make the ruling that the forum is going to make. But these uh, civil rights groups, these pro-democracy groups, you know, I think we all agree that Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, is incendiary, is hateful, um, is uh, a, a horrible representative of all of the values of the United States of America. I mean, she's harassed uh, surviving victims of school shootings. She's claimed that 9-11 is a fraud. She talks about anti-Semitic things all the time, Jewish space lasers, you know, uh, horrific, horrific, hateful, hateful rhetoric that's coming out of there. Um, she has not been criminally prosecuted under the sedition statute yet. And so this was a administrative hearing saying that she engaged in insurrection conduct. And therefore, this judge, this administrative judge should issue a referral to disqualify her. It's a weird process for me as a lawyer, Popak, too, because I'm used to in court cases, depositions, motions to dismiss hearings, you know, and this was kind of like, all right, just go yeah. for it. Like, like she just, shows up and she shows up in a sun sundress, swear in the witness. Let's go. So that's the background procedurally of what <laughs> took place. So then you have this hearing where the judge would make a referral at the end of the day. Um, the hearing took place. It lasted a full day. It was streamed. There is now post-trial briefing that's going to take place next week. And then the judge is going to read those briefs and then make the recommendation. And ultimately, Raffensperger can accept or reject the recommendation to disqualify Marjorie Taylor Greene. So that's the framework. Popak, you want to go into what you yeah. saw at the hearing? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll do a little bit more on the framework. So the different states do different things. And if you're in Pennsylvania, that kind of challenge doesn't go to the Office of Administrative Hearings in Pennsylvania. For instance, it goes to the Board of elect, elector, Election and the Board of Election convenes, for instance, there and in other states, a hearing and does the hearing. Georgia, basically, anytime there needs to be an evidentiary uh a process, an evidentiary hearing where evidence is presented and witness testimony, testimony is presented concerning any level of administration or any level of agency decision-making in the state of Georgia, they've, they've put it all under the Office of Administrative Hearings. They call it OATH. And so there's a judge and that judge normally hears things like, oh, you lost your dog license? Oh, you, you, you can't be a barber or a cosmetologist anymore. OK, let's let me hear from you and let me hear. Oh, your fire alarm went off too many times and you're getting fined for that. OK, let's. And that's a 20 minute thing. And then the, they make either a recommendation or they actually sometimes have the power um, to make a ruling in the election law area. The administrative law judge does the evidentiary hearing, developing the evidence, makes a report and recommendation to, in this case, the secretary of state for the final decision. So, in fact, the judge Boudreau, and I'll talk about him in a minute, a number of times he reminded the participants, both lawyers and other people that were in the gallery, many of whom who started to applaud when Marjorie Taylor Greene came in. So the room was packed with her supporters, including Matt Gates for some reason, who decided that he should sit at council table because because that's a good thing to have Matt Gates on your side. He, have, you know, soon to be going to jail for child uh, endangerment and child prostitution trafficking. But in any event, that's that he kept reminding Judge Boudreau kept reminding people, this is not the Supreme Court. And you're making oral argument there. I am here on an evidentiary hearing. Stop with all the objections. Let's get the evidence out so I can make my report and recommendation. And he was pretty even handed on that. All right. Here's his background. I looked at him. I looked him up on LinkedIn. He says, first thing about himself, he's a musician and a composer. 
He went to Harvard. He went to Duke uh, undergrad. And for 38 years, he's been a tax lawyer until he retired recently. So this is, you know, First Amendment versus election law, the 14th Amendment. This is not this guy's gig. He, he's a smart guy. I mean, I'm not a 38 year tax lawyer. He's not an idiot, especially given his credentials. But this is not what he's been trained for. He'll do the best he can possibly do. Now, I want to talk about the two lawyers that were on either side. I know one of them by one degree of separation, and then we'll talk about the other one. So Andrew Chelly, who has a very successful firm here in New York, I know through a mutual contact. He used to work for a former governor in New York as the chief of the civil rights division when that governor was attorney general, when he was Tish James. And so that's where Andrew Chelly got his start. Um, he's about my peer. I think we're one year off in law school graduation. And his firm is dedicated in New York to civil rights law, First Amendment law. It's very similar to what you and I do. Um, he's represented the Tribune Company. He's done voting rights cases and all of that. He's on behalf of the organization, the, the group of people that are challenging her eligibility or her disability to be on the ballot. On the other side is James Bopp, B-O-P-P. We've talked about his cases before because he has represented Madison Cawthorn. He's represented, he's filed briefs against abortion rights. Um, he's a former uh, district, uh, district attorney general or a deputy attorney general for the state of Indiana. He's a big member of the Federalist Society. And the only cases that his law firm take are on the right, right wing of the party in supporting everything that we've talked about. SB8, he's in favor of SB8. Dobbs, he's, he's, he sends an amicus brief in. So he represents all these people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. And in fact, at one point in the proceeding, he wouldn't let her answer a question because he's been involved with, with President Trump and the exercise of executive privilege. When they asked her, did you talk to the president about him imposing martial law under the insurrection? And she responded, I don't recall. As if, and this is, I saw a tweet of yours, Ben, as if that's such a, such a commonplace thing that, that the president talking to you about martial law, you may forget that within the last year, like you forgot what you had for breakfast last Tuesday. Uh, totally not credible as an advocate. And, and the things that she said that she did not recall, despite having the tweet the video, the interview presented to her by Chelly, who was cross-examining her, is mind-boggling. Uh, the you know, were, did did you did you say did you like the tweet about the way to take out Nancy Pelosi once and for all is to put a bullet in her head? Oh, I don't run my social media. I don't really don't know. I don't really know who did that. Did you once say that the FBI was involved with a false flag event and they were involved with with staging the insurrection? Oh, I don't recall saying that. And of course, they play the tweet or the video where she said that. Did you once say it was a false flag event and it was Antifa or Black Lives Matter that were staging the insurrection and not actually who it was? Um, I don't know. I might have said that. And then she brings up her QAnon theories about, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa, all in the same thing. So she spent an incredible amount of her three hours of testimony denying that she knew anything even in the face of these things. Now, for those that were questioning this on your, on, your, on your Twitter feed or on your YouTube feed, perjury. What about perjury? Yes, Georgia has on its books, on its penal code, a perjury statute, which is at 16-10-70, which says that if you're in a judicial proceeding and you do not tell the truth about a material issue that is the point of the question, then you can go to jail for between one and 10 years. But that has to be a referral that's going to have to be made off of maybe the administrative law judge to the prosecutors to prosecute the crime of perjury if they can prove if they can prove perjury. I'm not sure this judge is going to find that. Now, I do think that when the briefing happens next week, the post hearing briefing, I think it's on Thursday, and this judge ultimately makes a ruling relatively quickly because the absentee ballots for May are going out with her name on it. He, can he comment? on the testimonial evidence and the credibility of, of the witness? Absolutely. I mean, judges do it all the time. I did not believe the veracity of the witness who had taken the stand in their own defense. They say that all the time. Is this, you know, sort of 
Matlock, Southern, you know, federal, you know, uh, tax lawyer, retiree, musician. Is he going to go out on a limb and say that? I, I, I want to manage expectations. I don't think so. What do you think, Ben? I don't think he's going to find her uh, uh, perjury. I don't think he's going to find her in contempt. I don't think he's going to disqualify her. I, you, I right. don't, you know, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news because I'll tell you where I genuinely think there's good news. Um, for democracy. I think there's great news for democracy in what's going to happen in June with the January 6th committee with 850 witnesses that they've interviewed and that they have the goods. I think what we're seeing, you mentioned federal prosecutor Winman from uh, Maryland and the increasing efforts by the DOJ to rise uh, to increase to the top of the food chain of who is involved in the insurrection. I think one of the issues when you have these quasi judicial proceedings like Marjorie Taylor Greene that don't involve the same level of why is discovery important in a case? Why do we have subpoena power? Why do we have these authorities is because when you were questioning Marjorie Taylor Greene, all you were all they basically had were her public statements, her tweets. And while she showed that she's a liar, while she showed she's evasive, while she repeated the conspiracy type things over and over again, and what she didn't recall is completely preposterous. And you can make a big issue out of it as a cross examiner. Wait a minute, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Are you telling me here that this was, just to be clear, this was your first term as a member of Congress. Isn't that correct? And you had a conversation with the president. Um, is that a big deal for you to have a conversation with the president? And you can't recall one way or another if you spoke about declaring martial law. You don't remember that. That's not a big deal to you, Miss Green. That's just something that, you know, you, you would forget. That's something. And jurors, triers of fact, listen to that. And as you said, Popak, you would say that's impractical. That's incredible. We don't believe that. That witness has no credibility. I've interviewed individuals. I won't get into the nitty gritty of the cases because I represent plaintiffs against defendants in some really horrific, disgusting cases where I'll put on a witness, I'll put on the defendant and they'll say, I don't remember it. And I'll say, so did it happen more than once? I don't remember. Did it happen more than five times? I don't remember. Could it have happened more than five times? I don't remember. Could it happen a hundred times? I don't remember. Could it happen 500 times? And then I'll get with them. Could it happen a thousand times, a million times? I go, so as you're sitting here today, you don't remember if you engaged in that act one time <laughs> or one million times, you know, and you play that out and you look at the judge, you look at the jury and that doesn't, that's not a logical explanation. Sometimes you have to prove cases just on that theory. So why don't I think though, I listen to all of the evidence that came out. I think Marjorie Taylor Greene is absolutely an insurrectionist. Okay, I do, I, I do. And do I think that she wanted for that conduct to occur? Do I think all of her pre-conduct, all of her ginning up her base, did I think that did it? Yes, but in my in my view, I think you have to be like criminally convicted of the statute. I think you have to have, I think you have to have either the DOJ convict, you have to have, and you know, you have to have some finding, whether it's by Congress, you know, because again, where I get worried in this area is that. And I shouldn't be worried about it's the way it shouldn't be, but we know that the Republicans operate in bad faith. What I worry is that it will just open up the floodgates where you're just going to have every member of Congress in the future will be challenged because if they make a statement or if they say something, the Republicans are going to make them sit in a hearing. And then you're going to get in front of a judge, an administrative judge, who is more like a uh, Ali Alexander, you know, who, who may disqualify, you know, you know, candidates and they're not equal. Like Marjorie Taylor Greene's conduct clearly is antithetical to our constitution versus what they accuse people on the other side of. I just worry that the process itself 
is with limited discovery, doesn't achieve the ultimate outcome. And I know people may not like me to hear that. I, I, I love the, I, I love the idea of cross-examining Marjorie Taylor Greene. I love the idea of holding them accountable. You know, I, I, I just, I wonder, I, I have that concern, Pope. Yeah, and I, I don't disagree with you. Let, let me put it, let me put it another way. It is important to hold hold people accountable and call out their bullshit. And when they participate in insurrections to put them on trial for it one way or the other. So do I think the plaintiffs groups and the and the Chelis of the world that are bringing these cases are doing God's work? I do. It's important to have put her through that process. Do I think this is the actual process where she's going to be declared an insurrectionist under, our, under Article 14, Section 3 of the US Constitution? in the DM, the back of the DMV? I do not. Now, Congress can censure her. I can't even remember right now. Was she censured by, by Congress for any of this? I don't think so. I think a lot of this, I don't, was she, Ben? I think she was previously censured by Congress and then they removed her from the education committee. On the committees. But not, but, right. not, I, don't, but I don't think related to the insurrection. Right, so she wasn't even censured by her own political body because they don't have the balls to do that, let alone prosecuted yet for insurrection. And then you've got that, that interesting issue, that academic issue you and I have debated, not debated because we're on the same side, about there's not one person has been charged with the crime, and it is a crime of insurrection. Seditious conspiracy, yes. Obstruction, yes. So it, it, it but, but to your point and to the point I'm making, continue to hold their feet to the fire. Take the Mo Brooks, take the Gosars, take the Marjorie Taylor Greens, and go through the processes to have them denied their right to be on the ballot. Even if it now it'll have one or two effects. It'll either make them chaste and make them not participate in the next insurrection, we hope, or it's just another fundraising drive for Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, and then the other reality, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, is that even if Marjorie Taylor Greene came off the ballot in the Northern District of Georgia, we're not turning that corner that Trump won by 32 points into a blue district in our favor in Georgia. So, yes, we all don't like she's 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 the congressperson we love to hate. OK, because she's so blatantly and acutely um, everything that we think is wrong with the Republican Party and the QAnon fueled Republican Party. But she'll just re she'll just be replaced. It'll be next man up with another person. The, per the the challenger, the Democratic challenger has zero chance of winning in that district. Well, I, I wouldn't say a zero chance, but I would say that <laughs> it is a significant uphill fight. And Marcus Flowers is actually a good candidate. He's raised a lot of money. The area, though, is an area that elected Marjorie Taylor Greene. And so how do you defeat where there's a great deal of support for that version of QAnonism? It is, it is a real real problem that exists there. And then you have the issue of if the judge makes a disqualification referral, and then that goes to Brad Raffensperger, even though Brad Raffensperger was targeted by Trump and extorted by Trump, and Raffensperger probably does not think highly of Marjorie Taylor Greene would be putting it lightly, you know, does Raffensperger say that I think that this was the process for disqualifying or do I think the process was if Congress wants to do it, if DOJ wants to do it, if um, she's criminally prosecuted in the state for insurrection, it's a criminal process -y that she's, you know, found to be an insurrectionist by a jury. And then the jury's finding then has effect under the Constitution as it. But I'm with you, Popak. We got to hold these people accountable. I do applaud the lawyers for holding her accountable, but I do think it's it's a very, very, very uphill battle. She's not going to be found guilty of perjury. She just isn't. So I want people to know that that's not going to happen. Um, and when she's saying, I don't recall, I don't remember, that happens every day in court with witnesses who are being accused of things. And 
you as a skilled lawyer have to make it clear that that witness doesn't have credibility. It's a jury instruction, the witness's credibility, what they remember and what they don't remember. You can do things like the lawyers were doing there, refreshing the recollection with the document. Is this what you said? Uh, impeaching the witness by showing that the witness said that, oh, you don't remember? Put up exhibit three, put up exhibit seven, put up exhibit 15. You did say that, correct? That's what you said. Um, but you can't force the witness to say, oh, now I remember. They can just say, I don't remember. And then you show the documents and you leave it to the person who's making a ruling to say, well, that person's a liar. I don't, I don't believe them. But that's the overall kind of summary there of what happened in the Marjorie Taylor Greene case. And I do want to leave on this positive note, like here's what's going to happen. Like, I think that these hearings the Jan 6th hearings in June are going to be among the most impactful, meaningful, historical, game-changing events that, you know, it's almost like if you think of an international perspective, no one, no one realized the courage and strength of Ukraine and then once you saw Zelensky in action, and once you kind of saw it, it was a game changer of kind of a, a, of a framework. And even you saw Tucker Carlson, you saw Fox News trying to spin it, trying to downplay Zelensky, trying to prop up Putin, but you couldn't. The facts were a tsunami. It was overwhelming. That's what we're going to see in June with the Jan 6th committee. These facts are going to be overwhelming. There's going to be public hearings. There's going to be the release of the findings. Every single day, that's going to be the focus. And people are going to leave with the only conclusion that could be drawn is that Trump is guilty. Trump's inner circle is guilty. And that's going to be important for the election, but it's going to be more important for the democracy for the safety and safeguarding of our democracy, the work that Jan 6th can well, let me make two. Let me make two quick observations. One historical. I was nine during the Watergate hearings. Nine. I still remember them. Okay. So if I remember the Watergate hearings as a, as a tiny Popakian, the tiny nine-year-old, can you imagine what this is going to do to a generation at every age level about our democracy. And I think that was a teaser from, from Jamie Raskin about, about what's gonna be presented. But we know from having watched the impeachment hearings by many of the same people here, that there are deniers out there within that party that are gonna say, this is political show theater, political show trial, that none of this is true. How they're going to deny 800, it's hard to believe there are 800 people that had personal knowledge of the assault on the Capitol, on the attempt at a violent overthrow and an inside coup. It's hard to believe that there's that many people that have that knowledge. And, and one last thing in the presentation, because I want people to, I want to, I want to um, start coaching them about frustration levels. There's gonna be a certain group that's never gonna crack directly around Trump, even when you hear Ivanka's testifying or this one's, or Jared went in or this or that. They don't need, and we don't need, as if we were the prosecutors or we were or defense lawyers, we don't need every bit of evidence in order to reach logical conclusions and make a and make a case. There are times when circumstantial evidence, when inference, when you you get to the one yard line or one inch yard line of the of the football field, but you don't have that last piece to punch it in, but you know it's going to happen next. And that's okay. It's okay that Trump will never testify to the Jan 6 committee. It's okay that Meadows will never testify. It's okay that all of these people will take the Fifth Amendment. They have enough visual evidence, documentary evidence, recordings, um, text messages, uh, you know, emails, and then the testimony of 800 people to tell a, an effective, truthful story, a real truth that others can deny, but it doesn't change the fact that it happened. And I think I think you and I, are, there's things that we don't even know yet. And I'm hoping the Department of Justice knows that we're gonna hear for the first time in June. 
Have you checked out store.midastouch.com to get all of your Midas merch, to get all your Legal AF merch? We've got great gifts for Mother's Day. We got great gifts for any day. Go to store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com to get all of the merch. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this edition of Legal AF. It is always a pleasure and an honor to be joined by my co-host, Michael Popa delivering the most consequential legal issues of the week to you all. We're so grateful for you, our Legal AF supporters, our Legal AF students, our Legal AF friends. We'll see you next time on Legal AF. Shout out to the Midas Midas.